So I really encourage you to wake up. This will be an amazing session, amazing DLD Sync, our first in a series of many more to come. Unfortunately, we are still in, again, in, in this lockdown kind of modus. Germany had a terrible outbreak, outbreak again of, of COVID. Um, and it's a pity that we don't see us in, in real, that we have this screen um, between us. I don't like the screens, but nevertheless, it's better than having nothing. You heard about that we canceled DLD in January. We will repeat it maybe in summer. Let's wait and see. But to shorten the waiting time, we will have a series of wonderful DLD things. And one of this, we start with a very special one. Um, two friends of mine, two long time, Till especially is a long friend of DLD, talking about sleep. I'm, I'm very proud that this session, which is wonderfully supported by um, She's Mercedes, a program of Mercedes cars and Mercedes Benz, um, that we brought together two experts on the circ uh, circadian rhythm. Let me introduce you right away to Elizabeth, Cla Elizabeth Claremont. Claire she is a professor of New York, neurology. New, oh, sorry, I, I exercised neurology. it and I failed again. Sorry, neurology. neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital and director of the analytic and modeling unit division of sleep medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard, famous Harvard Medical School. I met Elizabeth at a wonderful mountain climbing tour in Kreuz, and she and Till gave after this um, mountain tour an amazing workshop, workshop on sleep. And this, people were so enthusiastic that they asked us, please do it again, please invite them. Yes, I invited them and I invited Elizabeth and I invited Till, who is a long-term DLD friend. You have seen him in several sessions, sh short clips of several sessions. Um, he, he talked with Hans Ulrich Obrist, with Ariana Huffington, with Esther Dyson and Maria Furtwängler. Till is the vice chair and head of human um, chronobiology of the Institute of Medical Psychology at Munich's Ludwig Maximilians University. So you see, my dear audience, it's a fantastic pair of scientists who will give us an, an overview about their research. Let me right now jump into it. First question, what is chronobiology and why is it so important that we do a session about it? Um, I think that's, that's something I would like to answer. Um, chronobiology as a word says it's biology of time, but that is not quite correct because um, whenever we mention the word time, we actually mean something else. So this part of chronobiology or of, of chronos is actually referring to time spaces, um, which are which exist on our on our globe, and th there are four time spaces which make life predictable. So we can't predict what um, uh, what the lottery numbers will be next week, but we can predict when the sun will come up. And since these um, temporal spaces, like the tides, the day, or the lunar month, or the year, they are all predictable. And of these, um, the, the temporal space of the day is, is for humans, the most important one, and probably also for most other organisms. We have developed a clock. Now, clocks are, um, make you independent of knowing exactly. So if you, have to, if you have to catch a train, you can either stand for 24 hours on the platform and look if the train is coming, then, then you sort of respond to what's happening, or you use a clock and then you can go away and you can ask your clock whether the train is coming. And that is what clocks do, and this is what the biological clocks, clock does. And um, we, can't, we should always consider that everything that goes on in our body is controlled by our very individual biological clock, um, and therefore it's a very important thing to know about. To add to that, the biological clock helps us decide 
or plan for when it's light time is coming soon or dark time is coming soon. So if you're a diurnal animal like a human, you might want to be able to predict when it's going to be dark so that you can find a safe place. Or you might want to predict when you're about to have, have a meal and so you can start ramping up the hormones and other systems that are involved with digestion rather than always having them always active. So the body clock related to time of day is thought to be useful for optimizing safety and metabolism and other processes. And then as still mentioned, we also in some ways are still sensitive to the monthly clock. And there's also an annual clock to which animals, um, other animals, and actually humans too, are still sensitive to the annual clock. And the, the way animals sense the annual clock is by how long nighttime is or how long daytime is. Um, I, I heard of many things about that my biological clock is ticking. I'm 67 year old and I'm probably, I won't be that long on our earth. So, um, I don't know, but what really strikes me, Till and Liz, is that many people who are watching now, they lost their bond to their biological clock. They have no idea about it. They need alarm clocks. They need melatonin. They need um, sleep masks, sleep pills, whatever. How come and what would you recommend that the chronobiology in our bodies will, re will be repaired and will be renewed? Is there a renewable process for that, for it? So um, I would say they haven't lost their body clock is still working very well. It's just not in sync with the outside environment. Well, it's in sync. It's not in sync with what they want to do. Let's put it that way. So as Till mentioned in one, of, in one of the clips, the fact that we get light at night shifts our body clock to being later at night. And therefore you're not getting enough sleep and you have to wake up. In the, you need an alarm to wake up in the morning. But that doesn't mean your body clock isn't working. It just means that your body clock's on the wrong time and you put it up relative to when you want it to be, and you put it on the wrong time using external cues. And then the second way in which we're not listening to our body clock is that we're not giving us ourselves enough time to sleep. It's something that you need to do. Your body needs sleep, and we'll, we can discuss that now or we can discuss it later. But in context of your question about people needing pills to help sleep or alarms to get up, you have to give yourself enough time to sleep. And if you ever had a child, and you try and put the child to bed, you have to help your body get ready for sleep. You can't watch a horror movie or have a stressful conversation and then expect to fall asleep immediately. You have to help your body get ready to go to sleep by usually by having approximately regular times of going to sleep, dimming the lights, relaxing, and then going to sleep, and then allowing yourself enough time during the day. I mean, during, during the night, usually I'm talking about people sleeping at night versus shift workers, to have enough sleep. So your body is still there. Your body is, body clock is still working. We will hopefully over the course of this hour, help people understand how to listen to their body clock and help it be more in sync with the outside world and what they want to do. Nope. One, could, one could even add that um, it is the, the reason because uh, the body clock works so mm -hmm. well, we actually come into these, the, the, these uh, strange situations. Um, if you travel from one time zone to the other, for example, it takes you quite a lot of days. It's a, 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 a thumb rule is a, a day for each hour that you have to adjust um, to adjust your body. And your body um, just doesn't feel right because most of the functions are, are out of sync and, the, and, and you eat at the wrong time, you, you're tired at the wrong time. And so your body clock needs to adjust, but the, the reason why we have jet lag is because we have a body clock and, um, and, and not uh, um, because the body clock isn't working anymore. A very good example of how we have lost touch of our cyclic world is um, what our colleague Ken Wright did with students in Boulder. So in most cases, Students live in live in dark environments, libraries. They are at home. They have they 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 study until late at night and have lights on and so forth. And therefore, their body clocks are pretty late, especially if they're in their twenties. We can come back to that later. But um, if you take these students camping, and suddenly they all they have is very bright light outside, 
during the day when the sun is up and no light when the sun is down, except for maybe a campfire, then your body clock becomes earlier again. And, um, and you are more entrained to the cycle and you actually notice the differences between light and, day, light and day, which you might not notice if you are studying in a library or in your apartment all the time, never looking out of the window. We lose touch with nature and we have nature in us. We're still very much an animal with a body clock and therefore we get into difficulties. I'm so glad that we have nature in us. But tell us about the misconceptions of sleeping patterns. There, is so, there are so many, um, maybe I can say stupid theories about what you do, what to do, what not to do. Um, maybe what are the most eminent misconceptions of sleeping patterns or in, in chronobiology? Which, what prejudices you can shift the way right away? So the first one is, can I sleep too much? I don't know about you, but I can eat too much, especially if you give me chocolate cake. There's absolutely no evidence that you can sleep too much. Um, I did an experiment in which we put people in a room and gave them 16 hours of sleep opportunity per day, 12 hours at night, and then a four hour nap during the day for a week. And in the beginning, the people slept 12 hours a day for the first night, For the first 24 hours, they slept 12, on average 12 out of the first 16 hours. And then over the eight days, it gradually went down. So it looked at like what's called a homeostatic process. In other words, they were too low, then they went too high, and then they went back to an average that for younger people was more than eight hours. And for older people was a little less than eight hours. Now, that means by the end of the week, they were lying in bed in the dark, not able to do anything for eight hours. And believe me, that's boring. Um, And so if people were able to sleep when they weren't tired, they would have slept. Um, and then there were other studies, other things that we did during that protocol that showed that these people had reached a limit of how much they could sleep. But sometimes people think that they sleep too much because when they wake up, they feel sort of groggy. And that's called sleep inertia. And sleep inertia is when, because not all of your brain wakes up at the same time. And so you still feel groggy as you're waking up. And sleep inertia is worse if you take a nap in the middle of the afternoon. Um, And for a long nap in the middle of the afternoon. It doesn't mean you didn't need the nap. It just means that your body is taking a little while to wake up. On contrast, there's a huge amount of evidence that if you get insufficient sleep, it's bad for every aspect of your physical, including mental body. If you sleep more than eight hours, or if you're in bed trying to sleep more than eight or nine hours and you still feel tired, there's a chance that you have a sleep disorder and you should talk to a physician about it. So that's the first question. Can I sleep too much? And I'm going to say, unlike feeding, eating, there's no way you can sleep too much. Your body will stop you. Uh, Beth, second, if I can just, yes. if I, can just um, I, mention, yes. um, I have this picture between eating and, and, and sleeping, which is sort of a financial uh, metaphor. Eating is like a piggy bank. Um, you can throw things in and they stay in there and they make the piggy fatter and heavier. But sleeping is, is more like a credit card. Um, you, you take out wakeness, wakefulness out of the, out of the credit. You, you have a credit for wakefulness. And if you took out too much, you have to pay it back. Or at the end of the day, you have to pay back your, your, the credit amount as you do at the end of the month with a credit card. Most credit cards don't work that you put money in, that you put wakefulness or sleep in. So um, think of sleep as being a credit card system and eating being a piggy bank. <laughs> okay, so, this was the first. Yeah, so on a related question is, should you sleep not sleep in on weekends? And this is really worrisome. So first of all, you should sleep in on weekends. You should sleep whenever you need to sleep. Once again, if you feel tired after sleeping an entire night, then you should, um, you should or for a couple of nights, you should perhaps see a physician because you have a sleep disorder. And there are sleep disorders, just like there are disorders of the heart or disorders of your gut or something, like that, or your skin. The reason some people think that you shouldn't sleep in on weekends is there's some evidence that's what's called the variability of sleep. In other words, if some nights you go to sleep at 11 and some nights you go to sleep at 10 or two, and some you, if there's a big variability in your sleep, then there's some evidence that that's not good for your mental or physical health. But that only applies if you're getting enough sleep. 
if the reason you want to sleep in on weekends is because you're only getting five hours of sleep during the week, you should sleep in on weekends in order to catch up on your missing sleep, to reduce your credit card debt, as Till just said. You should sleep if you need to. The, the, and so um, there is actually evidence for people who do not sleep in on weekends because and, and have short amount of sleep during the week that they actually have uh, worse health outcomes. Jill, do you want to add to this? Nope. Well, I want to add on this. Yes. Um, I think for many of our many people of our audience, it's not the problem of having too much sleep for them. It's the, pro the problem is that they can't sleep enough. They wake up in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. can't get back to sleep. And this yeah. is after in the, in the first first um, first views, it's it's not not that bad. But if it's if it's chronical, if you if you have a chronic sh short shortage of sleep, it makes you depressed. It makes you angry. It makes you nervous. What, what to do about this? So unfortunately, as we get older, our sleep is not as consolidated as it was before. Uh, mm -hmm. There are techniques that people can use to try and help them sleep better and through the night. So for example, alcohol helps people fall asleep, but then it disrupts sleep in the middle of the night. Taking a nap in the middle of the day, even though I've just said, try to sleep, get as much sleep as you want, as you can, if you take a relatively late nap, it may interfere with your ability to sleep through the night. There are also changes, so, you know, the famous stories about hot flashes for women during menopause that wakes you up and it's hard to fall back to sleep again. There are sleep specialists who can tailor specific behavioral changes to help people sleep um, when they have this middle, to help them go back to sleep when they have this middle of the night insomnia. And I would suggest seeing a psychologist or a sleep therapist to help work through some of this. I have a wonderful recipe for it. I'm not a scientist, as you know, but I'm a, a curious housewife. I, when I can't sleep, I, I try to think about the nice things of my childhood. Ah, and I had this good. and this and this, and all of a sudden, there are so many that I feel and, and to slap. But, but no, I, wait, I, 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 one more thing. I, the most important thing is not to worry about it. Yeah, so exactly, not to worry. Or you will, you might have one bad night, in which yeah. case you might sleep better than night. But don't worry. Oh my goodness, I'm never going to fall asleep because yeah. that will make it harder. And but that's it, one of the things that these psychological treat, um, uh, behavioral interventions help people with. Yeah, yeah. it's I easier think, said than also, done. Steffi, I think we also have to consider uh, that the what, what we call sleeping through the night is a relatively young. Um, attitude which came with industrialization and which came with capitalism who wanted us to work for 16 hours at the early stages of industrialization and they gave us eight hours to sleep and then they said be efficient get all the sleep you need um, in these eight hours this is not necessarily um, like uh, how we slept and I'm working with Brazilian um, quilombos who, are, who live without electricity, and, um, and I, I stayed with them um, quite often. And um, it's remarkable what your night looks like when you fall asleep almost at sunset and you wake, wake up again um, in the middle of the night and you go to the fire and you find somebody there and then you go back to sleep. Nobody told us that sleep has to come in one episode. <laughs> the episode should be ah. long enough so that we can go through cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, so 20 minutes or, or, or an hour are probably not good. But if we sleep a couple of hours, we can split our sleep into two halves. And these two halves could be a very short night sleep and a, a, a substantial siesta or mm -hmm. two sleeps at night. So when we wake up at night, it just could be that we are up at night and, um, and it's only because we know that the alarm clock will ring, yeah, that we get panicky <laughs> and that we say we have to sleep. But this is a cultural phenomenon, not a biological one. I'm so glad that you exactly. said this. I'm yeah, really glad. There's actually, there's actually a really interesting book documenting all the places in the liter in literature from Shakespeare to the Bible to other sections, other literature about people talking about first and second night sleep. Ah, interesting. And where people would sleep, then they'd be awake for a while, and then they'd go back to sleep. The book is called A Day's Close. I'm looking at it. It's right up there. It's by Roger E.K.R.I.C.H. 
E-K-I-R-C-H, sorry, E-K-I-R-C-H. And it's really fascinating about how changes by the Industrial Revolution and electricity have changed the way we think of normal sleep as opposed to what our body used to have. Because there didn't used to be, there used to be about approximately 12 hours of dark because candles were too expensive. But there's, there's, a, new age, there's a new age of, mm -hmm. of capitalism and that new age is lockdown. <laughs> and that new age is home office. There are many disadvantages to home office because you don't see enough nice people. But there are also many advantages to home office because you you save on the commute time. You can sleep longer. As many people we've made a study actually stop using alarm clocks during um, home office uh, and, and lockdown situations. And, and they, they can sleep more in their biological times. They don't get as panicky when they wake up. So making work times more flexible will help many people sleep better. Um, it is all in our head, both mm -hmm. biologically and intellectually, and we have to work on both ends of, of what, what makes us not sleep well. Super. So this is, was the self-help part. Now I'm oh, very interested. I have, in, I have Beth is not done with her, her I only four. Have three. Okay. So, four. Oh, yeah. Another oh, sorry. So, yeah. Okay. You know how much sleep you all need depending on how tired you feel. Interesting. Which sounds a little odd. Yeah. So I would say if you feel tired, you need more sleep. But if you don't feel tired, that doesn't mean you don't need more sleep. First of all, you might have had a cup of coffee or something like that. But second of all, there's very good evidence from a number of studies that how tired you feel sort of depends on how much, how tired you felt like the day before, the day before that. And people forget about what it's like to feel alert. The classic story is people who have sleep apnea or a different sleep or a sleep problem that's now treated and suddenly they're sleeping well. And they say, I'd forgotten what it's like to feel alert. So it takes a while, it takes a few nights of good sleep for you to feel alert again. And so if you say, no, this is what I feel like, especially if you need a couple cups of coffee during the day, you may not be getting enough sleep. So once again, if you feel tired, believe it. But if you don't feel tired, it may not be because you, you've gotten enough sleep. So that's number three. Okay. And number four is sleep is a waste of time. And then turning that over to Till. Well, um, <laughs> I've mentioned it many, many times that uh, if you if you shorten your sleep because you want to be awake more, um, is is a bad a bad math because you will be much more much less efficient um, after a bad night's sleep. So you need for everything you do you need longer. So sleep is not taking away from from wakefulness. Sleep is making wakefulness possible. And we always have to keep in mind that um, sleep is a bit like I, I compare it to a pit stop in racing. The aim in, in, um, in car racing is to win the race. The aim in life is to win that life. As a biologist, the main aim is to have offsprings. But um, as a cultural person, the main aim is that you have enough money to get old or, or enough food. So the, there is a race out there. And you, in order to win the race, even people like Hamilton stop to fill up the tank and to check the car, because that is making the, the victory possible. So the pit stop is making the victory possible. Sleep is not taking away from the victory. It makes it possible. If you want to be awake optimally, you should really make sure that you get the right amount of sleep at the right time. And then you will feel that, um, that uh, it, you are hardly ever tired anymore. I was, I was waking up with an alarm clock as long as I went to school myself and as long as I had children who went to school because you have to wake up with an alarm clock if you are not an early bird um, in order to, to start the day for a certain time. I was always a bit tired during the day. Ever since my children were out of school and I could, I could decide when I wake up, I felt throughout the day, I felt very alert. It, it was quite remarkable. So sleep is important and should be embraced so that we can be optimally awake. So 
I'm, what I learned right now is to put away the pressure in terms of if let it let it sleep, let it flow. Yes. If you you if you are awake in the middle of the night, good so. Think of the positive things, and then you sleep again. And pressure always makes you more tired and more um, more not functionable, functionable. But um, I, I really I'm interested in in your scientific work. What drives you right now? What are the most eminent and um, 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 findings in your work right now? What's new in your research? No. No, you go ahead. Uh, uh, my new areas of research are applying sleep and circadian rhythms to different areas of medicine and physiology. So I'm working with some neurologists applying light therapy. Remember we said light was so important for your biologic clock to look at the effects of light uh, to affect non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative process in which most people think of um, uh, difficulties moving, rigid movement. But it turns out there's also many sleep problems and we're using light as a therapy. I'm working with um, another neurologist looking at the effects of sleep deprivation and sleep disorders on the risk of stroke. I'm working with a psychiatrist in substance disorders, looking at um, the effects uh, of whether the restlessness associated with opioid withdrawal is related to um, a sleep disorder known as restless leg syndrome and whether if we treat it with the symptoms of, with the regular medication for restless leg syndrome, we can reduce that side effect and possibly keep people in therapy longer. I'm working with people, I'm working with investigators in women's health, looking at the changes in metabolism across menopause and whether it's the disruption of sleep as part of hot flashes that's causing the changes in metabolism. I'm working with people in radiology about whether or not sleep affects the ability to detect events, such as whether or not there's a rare event on an x-ray, working with people in, um, um, in uh, genetics on uh, neurofibromatosis. So I'm having lots of fun applying sleep and circadian rhythms to all areas of sleep and medicine. And, and a big to... workload, I think, a big <laughs> workload. <laughs> yes. it's, it's fascinating. I'm, I, I just learned about the term um, frontier technologies. As a micro, microbiome, quantum, genetics, all a lot of technologies which are on the edge of major outcomes. So are you using um, technology, as you said, for genetics? What, what role plays the latest technology in your research, Elizabeth? So I'm adding sleep and circadian rhythms to other people's expertise. So the geneticist is the expert in genetics, and I'm saying let's just include knowledge about how people sleep or how much they slept or when they slept to the study that you're doing about genetics or the study you're doing about stroke and using neuroimaging. So I'm working with experts in their fields who are using all these omics and the high frontier technologies and adding, asking them to consider sleep and circadian rhythms as covariates, just as they would include age or sex or race and ethnicity or other medical conditions. So I don't, don't need to be an expert on all of these. I work with people who are experts on all of these. This sounds like, an, uh, uh, sounds like a lot of synergies and synergies yes, exactly. and teamwork. Yes. And that's yes. great. That's, I think the future of work has to be on, has to work on synergies or it has to function on synergies. Till, want you, do you want to add something? To what well, um, I want to add that you grabbed a very old CV of mine, um, um, making you still a <laughs> Sorry for that. At, at the university, and I'm not anymore. Um, I, I, um, I've founded my own company in order to continue my research, because uh, if you are retired from the university, uh, you don't have an infrastructure anymore. And since I am still very active in doing research, I'm doing it now via, via a company. But what I'm doing is I'm taking normal measurements and trying to implement 
similar to what Beth does in the medical world, I'm trying to implement what we have no, uh, learned about sleep and circadian rhythms in the real world. And I'm trying to find ways to, pre to predict, for example, whether a sleep, uh, uh, whether an, a nocturnal sleep or any sleep was good or not, because so far we have l very little objective ways to measure sleep quality. And um, I will probably not, um, not succeed in it uh, until I have to leave this world, but at least I can, I can step towards the possibility of making measurements of sleep um, possible um, that tell us how good that sleep is. Because so far, we look at sleep, sleep research, looks at sleep in sleep, in, in the sleep clinic. So they look at sleep ac uh, um, cut out of context because sleep needs to be understood in the context of life. And that is that includes wakefulness. That includes the prior sleep. That includes the sleep and wakefulness of the, of the past week and so forth. That includes the time of year. That includes whether we had lots of days with sunshine or with rain. All of these things influence our sleep and our circadian rhythms. And I want to get measures of, for including all these variables into assessing whether our circadian life is good, whether we live not what I once called social jet lag, if we don't suffer from social jet lag. Social jet lag is if my biological clock wants me to live in one time zone and the social clock wants us to live in another time zone. We know all this because it happens um, in, in many countries over the summer when we have a, a daylight saving time, we are forced to live in a different time zone. But many people, because their clocks are late, are all, always, even in understand time, forced to live in a different time zone. And that is what we call social jet lag. And um, Beth has mentioned that uh, uh, practically all sleep def de deficiencies are linked to health deficiencies. And social jet lag is also linked to health deficiencies similarly. And I sometimes wonder where, where, where the sleep deficiency, because social jet lag always goes together with sleep deficiency, where the sleep deficiency is the major cause of the health um, uh, uh, deficits, or whether it is also doing the wrong things at the wrong time. But I am trying to find ways of measuring how good a night's sleep was, and I am going to measure it mainly during the day because that's when we have to perform. And um, if we had a good night, can be best measured in the day, and I'm measuring things at night in order to predict eventually what do I see in this night, how good was the day after that, and can I link the two and therefore make predictions of good nights and good days? I wonder... I no. Can I just I, try and give another example of what Till means by social jet lag? When he's talking about being in the wrong time zone, it's not, he doesn't mean that people are literally in the wrong time zone. They're not in mountain you. time instead of central time in the United States. He's talking in terms of if their body clock thinks that they should be getting up at 8.30 in the morning because they're a late type and because they've had light at night. And they have to get up at six o'clock in the morning in order to go to work or take care of their children. That's what he means by living in the wrong time zone. You're still literally living in the same social clock time, but there's a discrepancy as if you're living in the wrong time zone between what your body clock wants and what your demands are from where you physically live. And I hope that makes more sense. Is it, um, um, is it, does it correlate with patterns? Some people talk about sleeping patterns, and um, if I if I'm wrong, uh, if I'm correct, um, artificial intelligence is something to is is a tool to detect patterns. So, Till, are you working with um, scientists who are working computer scientists who are working in the field of artificial intelligence? Are you planning to do this? No, I'm. I'm I, at think? the moment, I'm using my intelligence, which uh, may be artificial, but it's it's. it's no, it's not. Moment. It's very bright. <laughs> and and once once um I I have enough tools, then we can go out. I am working with other people who do huge consortia, and mm -hmm. one of the major tools I'm using is measuring simply measuring activity and light for many many weeks. 
And um, even if you measure it for a shorter time, which is not ideal, but doable, and, and it's still quite useful, you can go into large cohorts um, of people who have been um, accompanied over many decades. So they started out to be young and lean people, and now they, now they are uh, 30 years older, and they, they, they get heart attacks and, and uh, have metabolic problems and so forth. Um, and we are using um, actimetry which is very simple by wearing, Beth, are you wearing one? Yes, you are, uh, because I gave my, my mind to somebody else because they needed it more than I do. So you have a, a, you have a little watch-like thing that measures light and activity, and it is mind-boggling what you can get out of this data. Um, and we are using it to predict in these large cohorts uh, whether, whether the activity and the light exposure of people who develop um, over the course of their lifetime, develop health uh, issues, whether that correlates with, with sleep, sleep activity and, and light exposure. But, so but, there are people using actigraphy, um, I don't know if you do use the word artificial intelligence, but using machine learning techniques, using fractal techniques, using a variety of mathematical techniques to extract data from actigraphy. And so, for example, one of them it shows, as Till mentioned, there are changes in actigraphy that, that can quote unquote predict the risk of um, starting to have worsening uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, that you see changes in the activity before you might see changes on um, standard functional cognitive tests. And if you can use those, you can perhaps start to intervene. And that's one of the goals. So artificial intelligence is one way of analyzing data. And so I'm just gonna expand your question and say, Till and others are working on using sophisticated mathematical techniques to extract information from the data. Interesting. I have another question. So I have many questions, but this is a question related to our partner, she's Mercedes. In my car, I have a, I have a steering wheel. And if the car, That's I don't good. know how, <laughs> yeah, it's good to have a steering wheel, but this steering wheel starts to, to rumble. And when the car thinks I'm tired, and what recommendations do you give car manufacturers for people um, to not fall asleep in the car? <laughs> silence. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's a, it's a wrong, I, it's silence because I, I presume that both Beth and I think that this is the wrong approach. You shouldn't have the car tell you not to drive. You should have an an awareness for for your for, for yeah. your tiredness, um, which people don't have because it's it's similar to have. being yeah. drunk. If you're drunk, you have the feeling you can you'll still do it. If you're too tired, you have this feeling you still do it. So, I would like a, a, a measurement here. Not only when you're sitting in your in the car, the artificial intelligence should go into a watch that is really well designed that should tell you where your internal time is at the moment and if the internal time approaches your sleep window or the opposite in the day where, where an, there's another little dip where you can easily fall asleep you should just not drive unless your your car can drive you um, yeah. but it's well, I, I think yeah. that that we can talk about lights in cars and and all kinds of things and of course there are ways of detecting if somebody who was irresponsibly driving that this person is now falling asleep. But I think it's the wrong approach to, to, um, to save people who are doing stupid things. Thank you well, for this. Get my camera to have my yeah. light, my, my, my face be lit. So anyway, there are a number of people who are working on the equivalent of a bre alcohol breathalyzer test to detect when people are tired. And so that would be one way, just like I heard, I, think that there are breathalyzer tests that are available. Um, you know, the police use them. And so presumably you could have one in a car for alcohol and you'd have the equivalent for when somebody is tired. The problem is there are many reasons to be tired. And so, and the physiology of them might be different. You might be tired because of you have circadian rhythms. You might be of your circadian timing. You might be tired because you haven't gotten enough sleep and the chemicals might be different in a breathalyzer. Um, the, I'm not sure 
I mean, it's a great question. I'm not sure exactly how to do it. Another question is what can you do if somebody is tired and driving? And the first thing I'd say is, well, you sh they shouldn't be able to turn on the car. Um, there are a number of studies that show that actually lots of accidents happen within two miles of home. In other words, people know they're tired and they just want to get home. And they just have an accident because they're too tired to drive. In the United States, there are what's called rumble strips on the road. For people drifting across lanes where the car goes, there's bumps in the road and you bump, 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 bump. Um, and so, but all of them would be, you are there because you can't, the car won't, car is turned on by a person who is fallible. Um, and so then the question is, does vibrating work? And how long does the steering wheel vibrate work? My guess is it works for under a minute. Yeah, under a minute, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, what the car should actually do is say with this sexy artificial voice, I am going to drive you onto a parking lot and I am not going to allow you to drive any further until you have slept deeply for at least 10 minutes. Because if you sleep only a bit, you can really re recover a lot of your alertness. Um, I, I always wow. compare, compare it for a short while. I always compare it with, um, with a snack. Um, uh, if, if you get low blood uh, uh, sugar, you should have a snack. If you um, get too tired, you should have a nap. Both of them are not the real thing. The, the, the snack is not a meal, and the nap is not a sleep. But um, uh, at least you, you are taken off the road, and you can, you can, and the car should give you all the possibilities, both with lying down and with, with white noise and with no lights and so forth, to make you fall asleep. But I'll hand over to Beth, who's, who, who thinks that um, it's, it's dangerous if you think that 10 minutes of sleep could get you back on the road. It can maybe get you back on the road for a half hour or something like that. Yeah. So humans have bodies and bodies have needs. And people need to recognize that when you need to sleep is not a good time to drive. It might be inconvenient, but it's better to be alive. So... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you shouldn't drive even though you want to. It's now fairly acceptable that if you're drunk, you don't drive. You know, who's the responsible driver? And therefore, there should be understandable that if you're tired, you shouldn't drive. I know lots of people think they can overcome tiredness. But there is very good evidence that you can't. No matter how skilled you are, when the body decides it's tired, it goes to sleep. It's not skill it's not motivation it's none of that the, when the body is tired it goes to sleep and you just and and we should never forget that it's not only killing yourself oh, statistically yeah, you, you are killing yeah many you're other right people. i have another question concerning the the body and um, how how important is physical fitness to my sleeping behavior so there's two questions, there's two parts of that. One is if people are overweight, they're more likely to have sleep apnea and sleep apnea is a sleep disorder that affects your sleep. So it's when people stop breathing during sleep and it, um, it affects their ability to sleep because they have to wake up in order to start breathing again. The second question, the second part is if you're physically fit, how well do you sleep? And let's assume, <laughs> um, Oh, I'm sorry. And if you're if you're overweight, you're also more likely to have like bone or joint problems, which cause pain, which interfere with your sleep. The second question is, if you're physically fit, do you sleep better? And there's some evidence that if you get a lot of activity and exercise, but not too late at night, it has to be early morning or afternoon that you sleep better. There's there's some evidence about that. Yes. Interesting. And then um, sleep affects sleep affects your ability to exercise. Um, so. Exactly. It's a circular, circular. Do you, do you see the but question? Sleep when you can and exercise when you can. We have an audience questions, Beth and, and Till. When you think about the vision autonomous of autonomous cars, which findings from your field of study can make the car of the future the perfect environment? Go camping. Go camping. <laughs> yes. Give, give give the people in the car uh, as much light as possible during the during the day, 
because even in a car you have a very often have a closed roof and you don't get much light and you, you we all have to go back camping or become farmers without having to leave our our industrialized situation but we can we can create recreate that so we have to go camping in a car meaning we have to give the people according to their own body clock actually um, a, as much light as possible um, and and as little blue light as possible during the night and um, if you are driven you should have um, the possibility to sleep but at the same time the machine always has to know where your biology is because it has to anticipate that if you are woken up that at the wrong time even within little cycles like the REM sleep cycle and so forth, you may be reacting to what the car tells you to do completely differently. So mm -hmm. the biology should always be in the mind of the, of the technology builders. And I can only advise technology to, to take people who know about sleep and body clocks uh, and, and put them into the, into the process of developing cars. To expand on what Phil just said, I did some work with NASA related to this. And let me give an example of what partially led to this was that one day I was, I live in Massachusetts and one day I had to fly to um, do some work with NASA, which is in Texas. And I had just flown in. And so I had uh, from Japan a couple of days before. So I had jet lag and then I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning by an alarm clock in order to catch an airplane. And I arrive at the airport and I'm wearing my teenage son's sneakers. So they weren't, you know, my husband's, they weren't much too big. They were just sort of a little bit wrong, but in my jet lag and in my tiredness, I wasn't able to sit to detect the difference. And on that same trip back when you, when you deposited a check into the machine, you had to type in the amount of the check rather than it recognizing it automatically. I had to, I typed in like $30, $35 instead of $350. Once again, not hugely wrong, but just a little bit wrong. And when people are tired, this was part of things I was doing with NASA, their ability to fact check their mental image of what it is versus reality changes. And if you're working with an autonomous car and you're expecting a person, especially who's tired, to decide when to intervene or when to use the information that's presented it may need to be different if you're tired or not, because the part of this is your brain can sort of do one thing well. It might be able to keep you on the road, but it won't notice that you're running out of gas or that the engine's overheating or something like that. And so you may need to change the display or the way you're expecting the car to interact with the person, depending on whether they're tired or not. And that's one of the things that I think about autonomous cars, that if it's a mostly autonomous car, but then something happens and you're expecting the person to suddenly step in and interact with it, that's not going to happen. You know, how is, how is a person going to be able to figure out all the information from the car that says, you know what, I can't do this anymore. A person has to take over. What's the best way of presenting that information to somebody, especially if that somebody might have been sleeping because the car was driving or might have drunk too much? Or even if it's a current car where there is some technology, this new technology about, you know, your, in your field of vision, I can see how fast I'm going or I can see some other information. How does the person interact with it when they're tired? If they're tired, does now now become so distracting that they can't focus on the road? So from my perspective, in addition to what Chill just said, a lot more work needs to be done on how does the tired brain interact with these increasingly complicated cars. You know, my car of 10 years ago just basically had a wheel, something in front of me that said, this is how fast you're going and this is whether you're running out of gas. And now there's, you know, all this other stuff that's happening, which somebody who's tired might not be able to process. So that's what my, that's what my interest is. That's very interesting. Did it, is this, uh, your search at NASA, was this related to, to, to this, what you just said? This was the tired, the the tired astronaut? Yeah, this was one of the projects I was doing at NASA. I was also very involved with the team that uh, designed lights for the space station. So um, in terms of light and in terms of mathematical modeling about when you want the lights to be bright versus dim in order to um, help the astronauts stay in a 24-hour day, because when you're up in space, you're not on a 24-hour day anymore. Um, but NASA wants to work on a 24-hour day. Or if you had to shift people 
to a different time because for orbital mechanics, that's when a spacewalk needed to be done or that's when a docking was. So that was the other part of the work I did with NASA was mathematical modeling of the effects of light and other stimuli on humans to shift them or keep them in training. Is 24 hours concept, is it an, an, an old fashioned concept? Do we come to a different, maybe 48 hours or more, maybe 16 hours? These 24 hours is a relative artificial concept, isn't it? No, no it's, it's the rotation of our Earth. It's the rotation it is, of our Earth. It, the light and darkness are, are at the moment um, 24 hours long. They used to be a bit shorter because the, the rotation of the Earth is, is, is slowing down, uh, but very, very slowly. So it's for, for, for the next generations, it, it will still be 24 hours. Um, the 24 hours have light and darkness, and you and every other organism in the world can predict practically everything from those 24-hour structures. When there is food available, when there are enemies available, when there are niches available. Available, <laughs> available yes. Yeah. Um, and and if, if, if I don't want to be around enemies when they are available, <laughs> I'm going mm -hmm. underground, for example. Yeah. So, so humidity, temperature, every, every physical aspect of our globe is predictable from the 24-hour environment. And that is why every organism has a circa 24-hour mm -hmm. clock that is synchronized to exactly 24 hours, and only then it can be of some help. 48 hours is no good, and um, what you will probably do is just ignore it. Um, your body will just still go, because it's a multiple of 24, it just ignores the fact that this is a 48-hour rhythm. It still will do uh, the 24 hours. So the variation, the related variation is morning versus evening types that we've been talking about. And you could argue that you want to have both morning and evening types because you want some people who are up just before dawn or at dawn. And then you want some people up who are late at night. You want to have all possible in populations so that you can defend yourself at all possible times. Or as I used to say when my children had sleepovers, you want one parent to be able to stay awake until the last child falls asleep. And then you want another parent awake before the first child wakes up. So you can say that having, in response to the 24 hour day, having some people who function better early and some people who function of course in the middle and some people who function late allows adaptability within this 24 hour day to take advantage of that. Does that make and, sense? And, and we should mention the, the, another misconception which is not a sleep misconception but a circadian misconception that you can actually learn what chronotype you are. You cannot learn it. You can do it with light and darkness so you can adjust with light and darkness. You can adjust your chronotype. Where, when we still were working outside and didn't have an um, artificial light, we were earlier. So we we adjusted our chronotype to be late by our light environment. But there is a huge genetic and an age component to chronotype. Chronotype is is when you if you are early the name for when you are early or late. And so it's not just that with discipline you can learn that as many people think. You are what you are under the light dark cycle conditions with your clock genes and with your age and you cannot ex escape this and the only way you can vary it is by changing your light dark behavior. Interesting. We have another audience question. Does the use of technical devices measuring the functions of our body, like the need or depth of sleep, make us lose the natural feeling for our body? Can I can I tell a, a, an anecdote to this? Um, because because uh, Michael Herf uh, uh, is is uh, also part of the intro here, and um, Michael Herf has is, has done a wonderful thing. He has taught computers to go camping, meaning that they uh, that the computers the computer screens take out the blue light when it when they sense that the sun is going down. And the first time I've implemented this F dot Lux, which which it was called or is called, on my computer, I was working, and you're always working and working and working, and suddenly the computer went yellowish. And I said, oh, the sun must go down. And I looked out of the window, and it was true. Now, this is what happens if you rely on technology to tell you something. It's sometimes good, but you should actually not lose contact to the real world 
and not contact your own biology, and then you don't get, get alienated by things that measure you. I agree with Till, and I also want to directly answer the question, which is, it depends on how you're using the device. If you're using the device to replace what your body is saying, then I would say, no, it's not good, especially since many of these devices have not been validated appropriately against standard um, metrics, which have been shown to correlate with, with disorders. So there are standard ways of measuring sleep, which have been shown that if this is affected, then you have an increased likelihood of a heart attack or a mental illness or something like that. And many of these portable devices haven't been validated. So we don't actually know whether or not they correlate with any of the health measures that are associated with sleep. The other worrisome thing is if you rely on it solely, then once again, since it hasn't been validated, we don't know if it worked. We don't know if that's the right thing to do. So I would say, if you have a device that says, walk some more, that's a great thing to do. You should probably walk some more unless you have something that interferes with your walking. But you shouldn't use the device to replace what you know about your body. Um, and until the devices are actually validated, you can't assume them, unfortunately as a um, as a medical device, because most of them are not medical devices and therefore they're not correlated with what we know about sleep and circadian rhythms effects on health. I, I just also want to add one more thing if I can, we have one and a half minutes. Um, as you can tell, Till and I love to talk and we'd be happy to talk more with you, Steffi, or anybody else who wants to talk to us about this. It's been That's wonderful to hear. With you. That's good to hear. I have one last question. If there is yeah. a magic, person who can can um, w uh, make wishes true what is your wish for the for sleep research what would you love to have what is the future of of the sleep research sleeping research of your work what is the future what is the magic um, uh, wish for um, for chronobiological science to come true Sorry for my bad English, but I'm so excited about your about your work and, and this hour that I'm losing my English. No, you want to go first? Well, I, I, I wish that everybody would wear an actimeter and send me their data. Uh, I have something related, which is we want we need to know more about how people sleep in the actual world. And yeah. then we have to help educate. So I have two answers um, and then help educate how that sleep affects their health and in many, many different ways, mental, physical, psychological, educational, safety, everything, economic. Um, but before we do that, we need to both understand objective sleep, like from a tigmature and subjective sleep, because they're not always the same as an in insomnia. And to do that, we need to study millions of people at home. So um, those are my well, wishes. This is actually overlap. Are, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for this fascinating 60 minutes. Um, I think we should continue in this year, within the next year, Fortsetzung folgt of Deutsch. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being so good friends for DLD. I'm very proud that you've been with us. Thank you for fun. your time and attention. Ciao. Bye, Bye Steffi. Uh, have a Bye. good sleep. Have a good morning. It's morning time. Yeah. Yes, it is. Ciao. Ciao, Bye. ciao. Bye.